Hello and welcome to Christy TV, the Straight Talking YouTube channel. Yes, as always, you remember to click and subscribe. You keep on watching, fully keep on giving. Yes, our channel you often associate with hard men, such as boxers, knuckle fighters, villains, people who have been to prison, and even gangsters. Yes, that's very often on my channel. Yeah, and we often tune in and see the fascinating story of the gangster, yeah, and the hard man. And now they get tamed. They get tamed sometimes, long prison sentences. They tame others with violence. But today, yes, the gentleman to my right was a former prison chaplain, and he's gonna tell some wonderful stories of some of Britain's hardest, toughest men doing some redemption. Yes, wonderful, wonderful stories. We're also gonna to touch on his friendship with legendary boxing trainer, Brendan Ingle, and the two books he has written, Yes, you tune in, sit tight, this truly is a wonderful, wonderful chat. Yes, it's all my pleasure and it's all your pleasure. It's not coming on Sky, it's not coming on Netflix, it's right here, Kushti TV. Yes, all yours, all my pleasure, former rector, prison chaplain and associate minister. Of course it is, Mr. Ian Jennings. Thank you very much, sir, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Joe. I Thank you. It. Appreciate the welcome. Very Thank you very much. All, all my pleasure. So I'm going to start. Um, yes, uh, I've done a bit of research as I have to because I come in completely blind otherwise, yeah. and I won't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, tell us how it started for you. Um, your Christianity, how you found faith. Okay. Yourself. Yeah. I was brought up in a Christian environment, Christian home, um, but although I was taking the church every Sunday. I got to a point where I really resented that and didn't want to keep doing it. So at 16, I decided, that's it, I'm quitting. Well, on that particular Good Friday, I wasn't in church, I was with some mates, and we were in a car driving out from Wakefield towards Doncaster in the winding roads, and my friend who was driving was driving too fast. The car came round the corner, got into a kind of wobble, yeah. and turned over and smashed into the car coming in the opposite direction. So oh, I was yeah. the one that was most injured. I got a fractured skull and um, came through. Really? No you were just belts. 16 at this time? I was 16. No seat belts in those days. So I came through the windscreen. Yeah. Right. Um, so I was in hospital for the following week. Um, I, it was a horrendous experience, but it was a good experience too, because it made me pray. And I oh. started saying, God, if you're there, please make yourself real to me make my life different, give me a sense of purpose, and that's where it started to happen. So from there, I, I got more involved in the life of the church, in the youth group, in the youth work, and, uh, and a sense of call grew until I went eventually to Bible College to train for the ministry. So that's all how it Fantastic. Began. So you, you had on something there, when you, you went in church early, so, so presumably from a, from a, a child of early memories up to yeah. your 15, 16. Yeah. And then you didn't you didn't want it. Well, do you mind if I just touch on uh, my experiences earlier in church? Yeah, absolutely. I, I used to think, um, the viewers at home, I don't know, this is my experience, I used to think I had to sit completely neat and tidy and the right, <clears throat> and um, be careful how you cough if you cough, and, <laughs> and say all the right things and be ever so nice and polite and quiet and I always go to church almost quite rigid mm. and not relaxed but um, I, I don't know if there's, for the viewer at home um, I now go to church and completely relax yeah. and when I join um, yourself and Christoph's Sunday congregation it's, I feel very very relaxed yeah. was yeah. any of that rigidness or perfectness Type of stuff stopping yeah. you from going. It, it was, it was in a way. It was very strict regime, you know. Yeah. Um, in those days, and um, so and it was a lot of church going. Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, uh, Wednesday evening, um, uh, and so that was my life, you know. Yeah. Um, and it just felt like too restricting, and I wanted to break off the shackles and do my own thing. But I hadn't really discovered the joy of knowing God's presence. Yeah. And really, at that time, discovered the reality of knowing yeah. Jesus yeah. for myself in my own life. But that's when that began to happen at age 16, and things looked a lot different after that. 
<laughs> so yeah, so so moving um, moving forward. So you're 16, and I know you, you you've been um, working in the church for. So you you, you become firstly a train a trainee. How does it work? Yeah. Train? Well, I went off to train for the ministry um, to a Bible college in Surrey, and uh, and so when I finished that course. I went to Doncaster as the assistant minister of a church there. It was a big church, about yeah. 300 people in the congregation. Yeah. And it was great, a great experience. I loved it. And I was looking after the young people and, uh, and making my contribution to the whole life of the church. And that was fantastic. I loved that. Incidentally, here's a funny thing. If yeah. you don't mind me mentioning it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we like a bit of funny. Well, well, funny story. Well, when I was in Doncaster, I was only, you know, from 22 to... 26 I was there yeah. as assistant minister. I came back 25 years later to be the prison chaplain in Doncaster yeah. and one day I was walking along the corridor and this guy noticed my, my uh, name badge and he said oh Ian Jennings. He said you, you're not the Ian Jennings that used to be the assistant minister of that big church on the corner on the roundabout. Yeah. Oh yeah I am. Yes. He said, put it there, he said, your preaching changed my life. Oh really? <laughs> oh, there you go. But, there's but, but now he's in prison. He's <laughs> in prison. Well, so, that's another thing. We've got so, the part we fall off and we're back on. And yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Another, that's another thing. It was thing. interesting. Yeah. interesting so 20, 25 years later. 25 years yeah, later. Fantastic. So I went back to the office and told my colleague and said, he said, my preaching, I was a bit proud, <laughs> changed his life. He said, I have to point out here, he's in prison. You chowdered, you changed his life. <laughs> so that wasn't the best. So like, like he, he might have been one of my converts, but he wasn't one of God's converts. <laughs> <laughs> now, 19 years yeah. in a tough Category A prison, Doncaster? It, Doncaster's Category A because it's a remand centre. So you've got everything there, and, right. the, and the security standard is very tight. It started off, it was a new prison in 1994, brand new, and it filled up more quickly than any other prison in the history of the prison service, really? which was dire, because it meant that um, the prison was being run essentially by the prisoners. Right. <laughs> it was a frightening place to be. To. Was it? Yeah, it really was. Well, we're going to touch on that in yeah. a minute, because um, Prisons, you know, they aim for the faint heart if that's the right yeah, word. Yeah, not always, right. not always, yeah. So you're 19 years in Doncaster Prison, which is a category which could be owned to all manner of people, from, from petty thieves right up to yeah. hard, hard murderers. Oh, absolutely, you. yeah. yeah. So uh, I worked in Lindholm Prison, Moreland Prison, Doncaster Prison, and then later on Leeds Prison. So those, those yeah. five prisons, yeah. So um, let's start with some turnaround stories. So for the viewer at home, let, let's let's sit on somebody on in the sort of gangster villainy world that's um yeah. what what they were and what they become. So give yeah. us give us a couple of stories that springs to mind. Okay. Um, the first day I went to Lindholm Prison was a beautiful July day. Sun was shining, the flower beds in front of the administration block were amazing and the men were working on the flower beds. I thought this doesn't feel like prison at all. Yeah, nice garden. <laughs> nice garden. <laughs> so I walked through to the chaplaincy and I found um, very quickly that I was involved in running a group on a Tuesday afternoon. And um, one of the members of that group was called Dave. Um, and he had come to prison and he was, he was in his 40s by then, early 40s. Yeah. And he'd been in and out of prison, you know, and uh, was a serious criminal. Uh, but he sort of woke up at the age of 40 and thought, what am I doing with my life? So in 40, 40, he's done X amount of years. He's yeah. already done a decade or more behind bars, isn't yeah. yeah, probably yeah. a decade. Give or take, yeah. 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 Um, and he's back in for um, a charge of conspiracy and uh, he's got another four years. So he starts to really think seriously. And he went to the prison chapel and he heard a guy giving his story, telling his story, who had been a prisoner yeah. and had come to faith in prison and his life had turned around. And as he listened to this story, he thought, that's what I need. That's what I need. Yeah. You know? So he came and, uh, uh, and in a simple way, accepted the gospel. He accepted yeah. Jesus into his life. And, uh, and the, the amazing thing was, Joe, that he was incredibly switched on to God. You know? yeah. I used to see him on a, 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 a Tuesday 
And it was always a joy to see him because he's full of questions, he's alert and alive and uh, responsive. Yeah. He's, he's getting to know God yeah. through his life of prayer, reading yeah. about the Bible, coming to chapter 6. And uh, eventually when he got released, uh, I was disappointed when they released him because he was such a good member of the group. <laughs> <laughs> but he had to go. He had to go. <laughs> and uh, he went back to Hull where he came from. He started... Uh, going to church, getting involved in the chaplaincy both in the university and in the prison. He went to university, did a degree, uh, he spoke Spanish, he felt God was calling him to Guatemala to walk, work with street kids, you know, the, yeah. some appalling situations in Guatemala. Was he, he, went was he partly Spanish? No, he just had learned sp Spanish, I don't know why. Maybe he learned in prison. Maybe when, when he yeah, was in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And um, then... Um, he, then he went on to Colombia and uh, started a thing called Oasis of Hope and it's an amazing organisation now with a school and a church and a programme for feeding the hungry. Really? Uh, loads of kids are helped through that and families as well, it's an amazing thing. Um, and he married a, a, a Colombian woman, got two lovely children, it's such an amazing Fantastic. story. Fantastic, you still in touch? Oh yeah, oh, it does regularly, yeah. Uh, how, how nice is that? So there's, there's one, there's a bloke probably spent 10, 12, 14 years in prison with his, with his yeah. last four years. Mm. And um, um, what a turnaround, so yeah, there's a redemption. Yeah. So you, you've got any more stories? You, you met any, any, any violent, tough men in there that turned it around? Yeah, I, I've met men who turned it around from a life of violence. Um, sometimes, not so good stories, you know. The, yeah, of course. The, I remember, do you, do you remember when Manchester had the riots, you know, Manchester prison? Yeah, well, I remember hearing of it. Yeah. 1990. Well, they were dispersed to a number of prisons, including some that came to Doncaster. And I remember going into the segregation unit one day, and there was a guy there standing reading a newspaper. There was no bed, there was no chair in his cell. Yeah. I said, what are you doing? You've got no bed, you've got no chair. Hey, I'll get you a chair. No, no, no. He said, I don't want a chair. I don't want anything these people can give me. He said, I've slept on a bed for 18 years. I'm not going to start now. I slept on the floor. Really? He, he was hard. He yeah. was so determined not to cooperate with the system. Really? The sad thing was, he was a lifer. And um, he, he wasn't going anywhere because he wouldn't cooperate. He yeah. wouldn't address his problems. In the yeah. Industry. I used to enjoy going having a chat with him, yeah. but he was not. He was not in the mood to change. I wish I could say, but then he became a Christian. Yeah. Then, but he didn't. He didn't. Sorry about yeah. that one. No, yeah, but but I think I, I mentioned it to you before. But he could get on well with you, but not the prison oh, officers. Yeah. Oh, no. He'd chat with me and we'd have a bit of a laugh, but he always standing up. He never sat down. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a long, that's a long time to stand up. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but uh, I went with a friend to a church in in uh, Sheffield one night um, and what had happened was this guy, one of the men in prison, walking down the corridor and saw me and he said, hey chaplain, Jesus came to me in my cell last night. Right. And I said, oh yeah, good, well come to chapel on Sunday. I thought it might be a bit of a wind up. Right. Anyway, he didn't come. So, so you didn't know how serious he was at this no, stage? No, no, not at all. You no. could have been winding up. Could have been a wind up, yeah. His way of taking the mickey even. And, and yeah. that used to happen a lot, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So he didn't come on Sunday, so I thought, oh, it's probably a wind up. And I couldn't find him. But a few months later, I went to this church, St. Thomas's Church in Sheffield, and it was a Thanksgiving service. And I took my friend who was visiting me. He wanted to see that church. And the Thanksgiving service was about people standing up and saying thank you to God for what had happened in their lives. Yeah. And this guy got up and I recognised him. And he said, I want to thank God for what he's done in my life. Ah, oh, it's been amazing. He said, I was in that prison in Doncaster and Jesus came to me in my cell, he said. Yeah. And he turned my life around, he said. I want a right toe like me. I want a right toe. Like <laughs> and he said... If he can do it for me, he can do it for you, he can do it for anybody. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He came to he saw me and he came straight to me after the service and he shook my hand and said, Thank you for everything you did for me. I said, yeah. I didn't do anything for you. But I think Jesus did, didn't he? He said, Yeah, he definitely did. Yeah, it was a message yeah. through yourself, exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, if, if we look, um, just for the viewer at home, there's, there's a little bit, um, I, I, go, I go to church a bit, um, and there's a bit there where um, Jesus. Um, walking through a massive crowd of people yeah and he targets the tax collector yeah. who nobody really likes no. 
and he 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 he, he, told, he so he wants to be with him yeah. to to help him turn things around. Yeah. So how these boys happen in prison, and that's from the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. This is what happened. So we can see that there's a pattern there, isn't there? There is. Yeah. So for anybody at home, if you think you're, you're misbehaving, I'm not going to touch on that. Um, and it ain't going right. There's there's always time, and there's always hope. Of course, there is. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what one thing. Um, it's often asked me as a Christian how, you know, what, what being a, a prison chaplain, example, um, you are a father and a grandfather, respectively. Mm -hmm. This guy is done for you're ringing cars, this guy is done for robbing a bank, mm -hmm. and this guy's hurt children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How difficult was it in as a chaplain if you had somebody done horrendous crime mm. it's mm. often asked how difficult was it to say well this bloke's done a crime this one this one's done a horrendous crime mm. was mm. it difficult for somebody even like you with your faith to to find forgiveness for these guys and could you could you could, could you see why the other guys wouldn't want to be associated oh yeah, yeah was there an awkwardness was it a difficult thing yeah yeah it was sometimes there was a wing in doncaster prison that was set aside for the um sex offenders and vulnerable prisoners, you know. So um, even even in the chaplain, they wouldn't necessarily be mixing. So you'll be on that wing. So would you would you have a different um, would you have different um, different chapels in different well, wings? Well, not a different chapel, but a different service. A different actually. times. I did because what happened was um, the previous chaplain who, uh, who felt everybody should be together, whatever their crime, whatever their offences. And in theory, I, I agree with that, but. Uh, one night, I got 90 men in the chapel and, and one officer, one officer, 90 men. And I looked up and I saw this guy who I knew who he was, he was a sex offender. We always came to chapel, no matter what, you know, even if it meant he put himself in danger. And there was a guy raining blows on him, you know, really pummeling him. Yeah. Um, so I intervened, called the officer over and said, you need to do something about this. Take this boy back to the... Um, to the wing and um, uh, so after that I said it's too dangerous you know to, to have to mix them yeah because they were always being targeted yeah, yeah. yeah well always, no absolutely yeah. I mean, and, and, and you can and you can see why yeah you know there's there's, there's good there's good reason why but yeah. we, we, we we touch on um, Christianity was a place for hope and people yeah for forgiveness yeah and potentially even people committing horrendous crimes, but it also says, it also says, yeah, that Jesus will come to judge. So even if we forgive, it's not necessarily it's him to judge. He's the judge he at the end of the judge, day. Yeah. You know. So if he thinks uh, you can't make the kingdom of heaven, then that's that's yeah. his judgment. Absolutely. And then you can. So. And the other thing Jesus said was, "Go and sin no more." You know. Yeah. The, you know you can't presume on God's grace. If Perhaps. you're committing those kind of offences, you know, you are, you, you are, you've got to change. It's yes, got yes. to be fundamental change. Yes. yes. And that can happen, but it's not an easy process. Yes. Not an easy process. Yeah, no, no. So, so that's, it's nice to, to get that cleared up. And, yeah. and um, you know, was, was there any, in, in this um, system, I mean, there's, to some tough, hard men. There's, there's all, there's all mixes there, including yeah. murderers. Was yeah. there ever any scary moments for you? There was a scary moment when, when I used to run a life of support group and uh, in Leeds prison, uh, and it was a great group. You know, we had some marvelous things happening. But then you perhaps won't remember this, but there was a a, a, a new offence that was brought in by the a new law brought in by the Home Secretary who was Blunkett at the time, David Blunkett. Yeah. And it was, I think it was called PPI. It was a Public Protection Imprisonment, indefinite imprisonment yeah. for public protection. So um, a guy may be commit burglary, but it's the third one he's committed. Yeah. So the judge will say, I'm going to put you under this order for public protection. What the guy didn't realise was that it was a life sentence. Yeah. So he'd come to prison thinking he's got six years to serve. He'll yeah. Serve four. But no, he's got a life sentence. So he'll do the six years, and then he's got to convince the parole board that he's ready to be released. Yeah. 
And that's not an easy thing, you know. No, so not. these men, you know, they were absolutely furious. You know, they'd been given this life sentence. It may be a small tariff, but it's still a life sentence. Yes. And they've got to do, serve the time they've been given, and then they can start to yeah. work to convince that the authorities are ready to release. There's still 140 people in prison under that. So there's a three strike rule announced system that's, that's, as well. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, crimes, yeah. so I was running this group and I've got 15 men in this room and um, they're all angry, you know, except the regular, like the regular actors were okay. But these guys that were in for public protection were furious, you know, and they were saying, what are you, what are you going to, nobody would come near them. They, they, the, life, <laughs> the life of the department gave them a wide berth, you know. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm running this support group. What are you going to do to help us then? I'm saying, well, I can't change your situation. I'm here to support you, but I can't change your situation. Yeah. Um, so uh, they, they got crosser and crosser shouting at me because I was the only one there. You know, they yeah. were, it wasn't necessarily they were angry with me, it was angry with the system. They let something out to yeah. Some, something. Yeah, they couldn't talk to anybody, yeah. So 15 people in the room. One of them says, we could take him hostage. We could do that. That would make them sit up and take him. Oh dear. If we take him hostage. <laughs> that sounds scary. So I'm thinking, where is the emergency button? It was right the other side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> the room. <laughs> so I really went into overdrive. I said, Ooh, listen guys, if you do that, you take me hostage, there'll be hell to pay. You think you've got it tough now? Oh, you'll have it incredible. Don't worry about getting out on your tariff. You'll be spending X number of years here. <laughs> it would be so, seen as such a serious breach of the, of security, uh, the, the, you'd be, so I really went into all Thinking on your feet, it's a lot, it's a lot. <laughs> so, so they kind of, they drew back from that, I'm glad to say, they drew back. But i tell you what I did do, I said, they said, what can we do then? I said, you can write, write to the Home Secretary, write to the uh, Prisons Minister, write to the newspapers, write to your own MPs, write a load of letters. And they said, will you do it for me? No, I said, you do it yourself, but I'll check it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll look through the, the grammar and the spelling. If anything needs to be improved, I'll do that for you. Will you post it? No, you post it yourself. Um, the one that is posted, I said, they will. They, they, they won't even notice. They'll let you post it. And they did. They said, send out all these letters. And then I thought, oh dear, I haven't mentioned this to the government. <laughs> But <laughs> so, so I wrote him a memo and said, right. this is what I've done. Right. And he was, he was very cross with me. I was carved the next time I went in. And he said, well, give me the right to do this. Well, I said, it's not my right, it's theirs. They have a right to um, complain about their situation and nobody's doing anything for them. So I, I was helping them to get the word out there. Plus you wanted to stay alive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but, it, but it's, it's good. <coughs> and, and, and that in itself probably gives them some direction in there, right? Well, it gave, it gave them something to do. Uh, it didn't make any difference, you know. No, no, I think that law's still in there, but it gives a thing to do it. It's the, they may have got out in six years and asking... And, and Blunkett deeply regrets that now, and would look to be able to change it, but of course he's got no influence. Yeah. But yeah. He, he acknowledges that it was a mistake. Yeah. And it was a, a terrible mistake. Yeah, yeah. yeah injustice, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because to some of them, one, 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 I, that, that I end crimes, there wasn't enough free murders and stuff. Yeah, well, so no, what you say. One guy stole a slice of pizza, you know, but he was like... It was the, oh, ridiculous, the right? end product of a series of yeah. yeah. So the, the judge, sometimes, to be honest, the judges didn't even realise the nature of the yeah. sentence. Yeah. So they said, oh, we'll give you this you know, public protection um, yeah. incarceration. Yeah. <laughs> it was horrendous. So, <laughs> I'm going to um, keep my hand safely in my pocket when I go past the local pizza hut. <laughs> <laughs> wise, wise, yeah. move, wise move. So for, for you boxing fans out there, one of the boxing trainers I would love to have met. Now, bear in mind, I'm a professional boxing trainer myself. I've camped in title fights, and um, yeah, but I'm not going to blow my trumpet too much. But I know my gravy a bit. But I am so in awe of the style and the way the gentleman in question, the great, brilliant, brilliant Brendan Ingle from the Winkle Bank Gym. Winkle Bank, Winkle Bank yeah. Gym. Now you befriended, um, let's, let's tell us a bit about Brendan, you, you become friends with him and you, you met Prince Nazim and yeah. other fighters and so on. I, I used to meet them in, in the gym, not the boxing gym. Yeah. They used to go to a, a, a hotel gym, uh, there's a swimming pool and, and uh, a whole load of um, weight training and so on. Um, and usually Brendan would be, and the, all his, you know, all his guys would be in the shallow end of the pool just having a laugh and a chat, yeah. you know. And so I used to join them. Yeah. I've never been a boxer in my life. 
amazing, amazing um, camp he had though, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, he was so entertaining, you know, he'd be telling stories and... So you're yeah. a rector of a church nearby? Yeah, yeah was, this is in Sheffield. Yeah, I was in Sheffield. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was, um, at that time, I was yeah, I was a rector at that time, and um, yeah, he was he was fascinating character and hugely respected. Oh, in I bet Sheffield. He was yeah. involved in the church at St Thomas's Winkerbank, um, where he was much loved. He was he had a, a real Christian faith, Brendan, but he also had this amazing ability to spot talents. You know? Oh yeah, for sure. And, and Nazim was one of his guys who was such a uh, flexible uh, mover, you know, ducking and diving, people couldn't land a punch on him, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, and he was at the height of his powers then. He went to prison though later, to the point of the prison that I used to be chaplain, Nazim, because he had this very powerful car, you know. Right. And he said to his friend, I'll show you what it can do. Well, he lived in the countryside with one track roads. Right. And he drove on this one track road right. as fast as the car would go, turn the corner, another car coming. Oh dear. And so there was a massive collision. And the poor guy broke almost every bone in his body. Uh, uh, so Nazim went to prison for that. Oh, well, I didn't recall that. That's yeah, interesting, yeah. yeah. He was he was um, he was convicted of And you were Chapman, did he? Because yeah. I practiced. wasn't the chaplain there right. then, but I knew some of the guys who were looking forward to coming to prison, Joe, because they would love to have a go at him. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was a Marmite character, wasn't he? He was yeah. a love or eight man, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, you know, but they wanted he's... to. He's, a, he's an international boxer. Well, let's get in the ring with him. Yeah. Let's have a go. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he certainly was a talent, didn't he? Yeah. And he just recognised. Yeah. So, I, I can see comparisons here. You, you're, you're in a church nearby to the Wink, Winklebank gym. Yeah, yeah like not that. too far away. Yeah. I always um, do, I, do I chuck a wink, 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 how do I pronounce it again? These Winklebank gym, is it? Winklebank, yeah. We're well, now Winklebank, is it? W I N C, Winklebank. Winklebank, right, yeah. Winkle bank. So, your church is nearby. Not too far away. Yeah. So, it's interesting the comparisons. He's trying to get kids off the yeah, street. Yeah, he did. Nurture yeah. talents are called yeah. bank champions. Absolutely. Yeah. But he's keeping prime primary, he's trying to keep them off the street. And you're up the road. Um, trying to achieve the same thing in a different way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's probably more effective than I was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he done brilliant. Of all the people, the trainers, I mean, the, the great, brilliant Manny Stewart's gone now. Yeah. Plus him, and so is Brendan. But yeah. of all the trainers, I would love to talk about Brendan. I love his style. Yeah, look and how, style, he, how, he, how he made that elusive. Yeah. And um, apparently, you could go into his gym and he'd be singing getting all these fighters to sing the colours of the rainbow and all oh, yeah, crazy yeah. stuff like this, but it worked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And apparently, you said, what guard? You go to the most gym and say, well, you got put your guard up, tuck your chin in, move your hand over a bit and all this. Mm. And then Brendan used to say, apparently, where's your hands most comfortable? And they go here or there. He said, what, keep them yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. he wouldn't move them. He said, yeah, where yeah. are they most comfortable? Yeah. Amazing, yeah. really, isn't it? But that's how we used to think. That's yeah, it, didn't yeah. But, but yeah. Johnny Nelson as well. Johnny Nelson. You see, yeah. you see we, we see a great talent in Prince Nazim, but Johnny yeah. Nelson went to his gym, I think he had oh, 13 yeah. amateur fights, only two are wins out of 13. Mm -hmm. And most, most professional trainers would have said, there's the exit that way. Mm. We've got no place for you. But he made him champ one of the longest reigning champions of the world ever. Uh, probably about the fourth longest reigning ever behind Klitschko, Joe Louis, and somebody yeah. else, yeah. Larry Holmes. He's about seven years yeah, old, champion. Yeah. Amazing. So that was um, and a really nice bloke. Yeah, and oh, you said you yeah, really nice well, bloke. Yeah. That's a lovely story. And that that uh, in the Lindholm prison because it was a category C, so or kind of semi-open, you know. They would have boxing demonstrations. Yeah. You know, people like um, um, the guy who you just mentioned, Johnny Nelson. Johnny Nelson. Yeah. yeah they'd have Johnny Nelson. And, and people like that were happy to come and you know give the guy something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. If you think you're hard, just have a few rounds with Johnny Nelson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, really, when you see combat, especially back, going back, so you, I mean, it comes to World War I and II, as yeah. brings to mind, combat, obviously, people out there yeah. in their most fiercest um, yeah. combat situations. Yeah. And boxing's a tough, you know, okay, yeah. it's not war, but, yeah. but Christianity had a big place, in, in, in clearly in Brendan's camp, he had a big place. Yeah. And, and in the military, you had a big place. Yeah, sure. And yeah. Uh, in one of your churches somewhere, you had a bit of a. You found some historic um, right up there, I think. Oh, that's, that's right. Yeah, it was quite um, interesting. When I was rector of All Saints, there was a minute book from the Church of England Men's Society from the First World War. You know, um, and so it would be recorded sad news of the death 
of one of our number, such and such a body, has died in action at the front. So um, it was fascinating to read it because it was just an ordinary minute book. Yeah. But it told amazing stories about real people. Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes what we see is a list of names. Don't yeah, of it. course. Yeah. But they were real people who had emotions and struggles and hardships and who were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah. You know, which is extraordinary. And, and, and what, 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 um, what debt we, we, we owe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they all, you know, my son is in the military and he told me when he was doing his initial training. The, the, the guy who was teaching them, lecturing them, said, don't you say, I'm not going to get killed. You might be the one. You've got to be prepared for that. Yeah. You might get killed. Accept that reality. Yeah. You know, so that's part and parcel of the training. You know, the, the possibility of dying young. You know, which well, is, yeah. well that's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, I had a friend served in the Falklands War. Yeah. And I used to drink with him. And um, I said, John, what was it like? And he went, Crapping myself from start to finish, yeah. praying to God that one bullet just wouldn't hit me. Yeah. But he said, that fierce, brave, young soldier, he said, it's nothing like that. He no. said, you are feared from, yeah. from start to finish. Of course. Just praying that one don't come and strike you, yeah. like it as your mate or the enemy or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. So, um, sadly, in 2016, a devastating, devastating news hit home. You lost your beloved wife in 2016. Yeah. Now, um, what did you, from your Christian faith, um, explain please how you, because I mean, your wife wasn't, she was only 65, that is that is nothing, nowhere near old. Um, you dealt a blow. Mm. How did you pick up the pieces? Yeah. Um, please tell us. She, she um, was looking forward to me retiring. And I said I'd retire at 68, and she had, she was the oldest, she was a teacher, and she's the old, fe oldest female teacher in her school before she retired. So she'd only just retired. And um, it, we began 2015, you know, full of hopes and plans for our retirement. And then on the 11th of January 2015, um, she woke up in the middle of the night and said, I feel sick here. Um, I'm getting up. So I said, oh, I'll get up with you. No, she said, don't, because there's no point in both of us losing sleep. Um, but she said, I've not felt like this before. So she got up and sat on the sofa and she became very cold and disoriented. And then eventually she started with these terrible seizures. And she was rushed to hospital that night. Um, and she had seven seizures on the way to the hospital, you know. So I thought I was going to lose her that night. But amazingly, she came through that, and uh, we didn't know what was wrong initially. They did all the tests, and then finally they came to the conclusion that she had a brain tumour. And it was the worst kind, the worst kind of aggressive yeah. brain cancer. And uh, the doctor said, probably 18 months. And it was, 18 yeah. months from the day she became ill to the day that she died. And in the kitchen, I remember us standing together, you know, holding each other. And she said to me, Ian, I can't believe that I have to leave you in a few months. And then she said, you should write a book about this. And I said, well, I don't know about that book, but I can write something. Anyway, so I used to put something on Facebook every month after she died. And uh, people said, oh, you should make a book of this. So I did. It's, it's, it. But what I love about this is that I had permission to write it. So it's, it's very personal. But she gave me permission to write it. And I think she thought that it would be good for me, it would be therapeutic, and it might help other people who were going through the same circumstance. And it did help me. It was like quite therapeutic to write, to write the to write up the story. And it's called By a Departing Light, Growing Through Grief. Um, so it's the story of, of dealing with the devastation of grief, the pain in the middle of your chest, the sense of pointlessness. Now the person that you loved and you were sharing your life with is gone and then having to struggle through those experiences to a point where life really becomes life again um, and uh, you know Jesus said I've come that you might have life and have it in all its fullness um, and even through those darkest and most difficult experiences that life throws at us we can discover that amazing gift 
you know, of, of the life that God gives and come alive to God and come alive to others, come alive to ourselves, you know. Mm. Well, that's absolutely heartbreaking, but you've, you've, I mean, I've written the book. Yeah. When I get to the sad bits, I, I literally used to write mine um, on paper like this, A3, A4, if you call it. Yeah. And I think it's A4. <laughs> yeah. And I find certain pages to be full up full, of tears. Yeah. It must have been, it must have been terribly difficult yeah. writing that. But you've done it. Do you just want to hold it up for the camera again? Because this could be, obviously, you've written it to help other yeah. people. Yeah, it's called By a Departing Light. Um, you can get it from Amazon or you can get it from me. Yeah. Well done. So that's, that's brilliant. And, well, that, that sounds like it took a bit of bravery. And, and um, I'm clearly, naturally, sorry for mm -hmm. the love you lost. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, you found some strength in writing yeah. it. And seeing out what she wanted. She actually meant an engine. She that's, it. that's right. She said it. She said, you must write a book about that. That took courage just to send her own. In her own exactly. Place, yeah. I mean, there she is. She's dying in the most horrendous disease. But she's thinking, you should write a book. It would maybe help you. And I'm sure it's helped many, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And um, mo moving on, you had then a follow-up book. Yeah. Uh, it's called, uh, What is Life Without My Love? Um, actually, it, the, the title comes from a song, an old song. When I was a kid, um, we didn't have a telly, yeah, we, but we got a, um, a, a, a radiogram, you know, these big Bakelite bulbous things. I remember the day I came home to listen to music on this machine, but uh, my parents were slow to buy records. They'd only got two records. One was um, John Sutherland, I think it was, singing what is life to be without you? What is life without my love? Yeah. And there was another one, Paul Robeson singing the Volga Boat song. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't the most exciting yeah. music for a, for a 12 or 15 year old boy. But, but um, that, that stuck in my mind. It was a beautiful song. And what is life without my love? Was, so I used that for the title. But uh, the, the idea in this book is to provide opportunity to deal with some of the practical consequences of losing a loved one. And uh, I've used it as a basis for a course for bereavement, you know. Yeah. And we've got a bereavement group running at uh, St Mary's, which I run. And it started off by us all using the book, you know, reading the book, sharing together and discussing the issues. Um, what a wonderful. I, I'd like to, um, yeah, I'm a Christian, um, as I said earlier, but, um, you know, um, this book, What is Life About My Love? and the first book. I just look like um, if, you know, we, we, see, we see Evan as the, you know, the, 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 the place to strive for eternal yeah. life. Um, but I'm an absolutely amazing, um, if you, for some of your viewers at home, that may be on the edge of Christianity, you're not sure, don't want to do it, do want to do it, part practice it, Mm. Mm. Look at what this gentleman I've got, to, you know, has achieved right here. You know, if you can't quite see Evan and what's happening, we can see the effects that it's making in yeah. helping people with bereavement. And I think that's wonderful. Yeah. You know, I think that's good. You're working on a new book. I am. Yeah, it's about prison, prison ministry, prison chaplaincy. Yeah. yeah. It's um, slow going, but uh, yeah. I'll get there in the end. Good. <laughs> Very good. Now. Um, Tell us, Ian, what's your favourite redemption song? You know, well, you, you've been in these prisons. What's one that's really sticks in your mind that turned it around? You think, what a turnaround. So, so you mean literally a song? What do you mean? No, no a person that's, oh, that's right. failing the law, yeah. up to mischief, criminal, yeah. and, he, and he's turned it around. He's gone from that to that. My, 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 I think it would be Dave, who I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Well, there's several others, you know. I, I tell you one that I really, really loved. It was uh, a guy who came along to my group on a Tuesday called Vince. And um, he, he struggled, you know. He was, he was not like Dave. He kind of struggled in, with his faith. And he'd come across and say, oh, I'll let myself down this week. I've had some drugs, you know. Um, and he'd come for a prayer and some help. And we'd spend some time in discussion. And, uh, but one, the thing that really turned it around for him was a verse from the Bible, um, which um, is a bit of an obscure verse, really. 
but it, it's um, about living soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So he read that verse and he said, that's it, that's what I want to do. Live soberly and righteously and godly, that's what I want to do. And he went back to the wing. He came back the following Tuesday, I've done it, he said. I've been getting a kick out of living soberly. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, such a kick. <laughs> anyway, one day, this is the extraordinary thing about Vince. He went back to the wing one day and the officer said to him, you, you need to go on a pre-release course because you're due out in six weeks or eight weeks or anything. And he said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not due out for another 12 months. No, no, you're due out. You, you, you need to go on a pre-release course because you are due out. Um, so he thought, gosh, they've made a mistake and they think I'm due out. And they're probably going to release me in six weeks instead of a year. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he came across to the chaplain and said, what shall I do? You know. Uh, they, they think, I mean, that everything's in, in motion for me to do the pre-release pre -release course and to be released. And, um, and we said, well, it's up to you. Will you, do, will you dog me in? Will you grasp me up? No, you know, you, <laughs> you can live with it. We can live yeah, with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so he went back to the wing and in the end he said to the officers, you're wrong. You've got it wrong. You need to check right back in the records because I am not due out yet for another 12 months. So they said, we don't make mistakes, yeah, so, yeah. but they did. Yeah. And they went back and they came back and said, yeah, you're right, you're not due up, but why did you tell us? You were on your way, yeah. you, were, you were going to be walking out of those gates, yeah. why did you tell us? And he said this, he said, up to now, the whole of my life has been based upon lies and deception and criminality. I want the whole of my future to be based upon honesty and truthfulness and integrity. Oh, what a wonderful story. So I couldn't walk out those gates with that hanging over my head. Brilliant. And as far as you know, he's, he carried well, on. Well, I'll tell you what happened with, with him, Joe. Uh, he, went, he went to work in the catering industry, and then he went to London Bible College to train. Yeah. Um, he came up to Lindholm, the prison where he had been a prisoner, and um, I got special permission for him to come in and to, to share his story, you know. Yeah. And so the, the men were all ears, you know, this yeah. was the guy who was one of us, he sat yeah. here, you know, and now his, his life is completely oh, changed. Oh, wonderful. One, one, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful story. Yeah. One of the things, um, I had my own spiritual experience and having turned these guys around because I was, um, I was no, uh, <laughs> I was no safe myself. I mean, I've been around in, around the block, with some t-shirts and, um, yeah, but in 1994 I had a spiritual experience with Jesus and I used to believe in hope, go to church a little bit with the family, and now I believe in no. So if you believe me, trust me, I know, fact, um, not if but maybe, that um, there is the Lord Jesus Christ and he's there for you. But I tell you, as well as he's there for everybody, if you just want to reach out, if you're not already there. But um, one of the things I, I interview, I've got friends who are ex-gangsters and mm -hmm. villains and criminals yeah. and whatever and I interviewed them but never I just said had a word with this um, with our friend Christoph once never all oh, these old men they, they can badmouth this man they badmouth that man they would have a go at him I never yeah. ever hear all these hardened men ever yeah. ever say anything no. about no. our yeah. Lord Jesus Christ the Saviour they never ever 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 and they, if they you know if they don't Preach, no. practice Christianity, but they never they you find the same in prison. They yeah. never ever go against. No, they had real respect, you know. Have yeah, respect. And I remember once going into the segregation unit, and uh, I was about to, I'd been talking to this guy. I was about to leave his cell, and I saw in black felt tip above the door. Anybody who locks up another human being is an absolute bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned back to him and said. Listen, this is the worst part of the job for me because I've got to lock this door when I leave. Oh, it's not you, he said. No, no, <laughs> you don't lock us away. You open doors for us. Oh. You and the chaplains, you're the one who opens the doors. There for you us. go. So not really lovely. Exactly, yeah, you open the doors. Really sort of yeah, yeah. A, a real kind of affirmation of respect. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciation, yeah. It seems like you've had um, a good, uh, you know, I mean, if you take example, what we said back earlier that we felt a little bit that uh, we have to be prim and proper to go to the church. You don't like that. 
I go to church in this gentleman's presence and it's wonderful and it's relaxed. Mm. I mean, um, he's, he's, he's a Newcastle fan. I wasn't so happy with him a couple of weeks ago. I'm a Brentford fan. I think they whopped us 5-0 mm. on the same. Well, mm. he goes on the terraces and, um, <laughs> and eats a burger and does all the things we do. The doors open, as he's explained. Um, yes, it's the doors open for all of us. And you open doors mm. and... Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and the, that's right. the, 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 the biggest door open there is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Absolutely. It's there it's there to be opened. Yeah, yeah. You've only got to pull it. It's there, Absolutely. example. Yeah. Um, finally, it's been absolutely wonderful, wonderful um, to chat. I've really, really enjoyed it. What message would you give out there for a young criminal or a young person that's maybe not into criminality, but not, you know, not, not um, completely honest with herself? What's the message would you give out there for somebody who... Well, to turn things around potentially. There's a couple of things. First of all, you could pray, you know. Uh, God be merciful to me, a sinner. We are all sinners, and that's a simple prayer. If it's said in faith, it can be really transformative. Also, seek out people who can encourage you, who can build your faith, who can point you in the right direction. Don't hang around with people who are going to drag you down, hang around with people who are going to build you up. That's so important. And if you can do that, open your heart to God, just be open-hearted. You don't have to, you know, kind of work at being a, a dignified and suited and booted kind of Christian. Just be open-hearted and, uh, and God can come to you. And what I said about the guy who said, Jesus came to me and myself. He can come to you in your room, in your home, on the street. He can come to you and bring some change and transformation into your life too. Well done, so there we have it. People at the OAS Tardis Toughest End, guns, knives, baseball bats, criminality, violence, thieving, deception, deceit. The biggest winner of all is love. Love, yeah. And we can get that through our Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been all my pleasure. Oh, it's been absolutely wonderful. You, you remember, you click and subscribe.